truth. It's what God has spoken, what God has revealed about himself, about his plan, about his purposes. What do we do with the truth that God has given us? The truth about himself, about ourselves, truth about um, who he is, how we've been separated from him, how we can be reunited with him again. One, we live it, and two, we proclaim it, right? What do we do with this truth, the truth of God? We, we live it, live it out, obey it, live our lives accordingly to understanding who God is, and we proclaim it. So we're going to look this morning at the first eight verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul kind of explains um, his visit to the Thessalonians, his heart, uh, as he was taking the gospel to them. We're going to look at the, the manner of a steward, the message of a steward, and the motive of a steward. First, let's take a look at the manner of a steward. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first two verses, the manner of a steward. Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was, was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Now, chapter, one, chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul expresses he's thankful for the fruit that they've borne. He's thankful for their faithfulness and the love that they're showing and, and all that they're doing, uh, the, the fruit in their lives. He's thankful for that. And in chapter 2, he revisits how he brought the gospel to them, to Thess uh, to. Thessalonica. The first thing he mentions is the manner of a steward is with great difficulty. With great difficulty. Acts chapter 16, Paul went to Philippi, um, and, and they went to, to share the gospel, and Paul and Silas and the rest of their group, and he cast a demon out of a gal and sharing the gospel with folks, and not everybody was thrilled about that. So he was arrested beaten with rods. I mean, those words are just there in Acts chapter 16. We just read right over. Oh, you got beaten with rods. Beaten with rods. And then thrown in, in prison, or really a dungeon, and their feet were placed in stocks. Just trying to help folks, right? Just trying to help folks. And they are arrested, beaten, placed in stocks. Well, God said that's enough of that, and so miraculously they were set free. Read it all about it in Acts chapter 16. And then they made their way to Thessalonica, and there they're proclaiming Christ again, and many people are listening and, and embracing the message of Christ, but some aren't crazy about it, so they tried to chase them down there and arrest them. God allowed them to s slip out of that situation, but they went to this man named Jason's house who was supporting them and and they just gave him fits. Why is it so difficult? Why is sharing the gospel with people in the world, people around us, why does it, so often is it so difficult? Components of the gospel are all are guilty, right? All of us are guilty. We've all broken God's law. Not everybody wants to hear that. All must repent, turn from chasing their own pursuits, chasing after sin, chasing after that which... God doesn't want us chasing after and trust in Jesus. Not everybody wants to hear that, right? Examples of the difficulty of sharing truth. We see it in Jesus' life. We see it in Paul's life. Uh, stewards of God's truth. Jesus said, John 15, verses 19, 20, he said, if you are of the world, the world loves its own. But as it is, you're not of the world. They persecuted me. They will persecute you also. That's encouraging. Not everybody wants to hear the truth about God. Not everybody wants to hear. You're not living like the one who made you wants you to live, right? And then Paul, Paul says, and tells Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why is that? People don't want to hear the truth about who God is and how he wants us to live, right? There is such a, such a, a difficult tension, a difficult balance between 
Romans 12, 18. Um, if possible, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Right? We're, we're the best we can. We're to be at peace with everyone. We're to be winsome. We're to not just be contentious and try to get under people's skin. Best we can, we're to be at peace with all men. And Jesus' words in Luke 6, verse 22 Woe to you when all men speak well of you. That, that's a difficult tension there, isn't it? What he means is, woe to you who just say what people want you to hear. We've got to share the truth, but we've got to share the truth in a way that hopefully will not be just abrasive, right? We need to be both winsome and unwavering. That's a difficult balance, isn't it? You tracking with me there? We're not to be, I, I've got friends who just love to get all up in your face with, um, you're a sinner, and man, that's a super important message, isn't it? That's truth. And yet, God calls us to do it in love. That, that, can, be di that can be difficult. Here's a picture. Here's a picture. The whole world is sick. Some people have the cure. But most of the sick, many of the sick, hate the cure, and they hate the, the cure givers. Right? Everybody's sick with sin. And they don't want the cure. The cure... That doesn't sound good to me. i got to quit doing this, that, and the other and, and do what this Jesus character wants me to do. That's what I, that was, those were my words when I first heard about Jesus at age, not first heard about him, but was, was challenged to trust in Christ. My, my thought was, man, I've got enough people telling me to do without this Jesus character telling me what to do. And then, boom, he revealed himself to me, and it all changed. It all changed. He's alive. My, my first thought? Coming to Christ, my first thought, Jesus is alive. He's real. But until then, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want, I didn't want the cure. I didn't want to hear what the cure givers had to say. The mission of every follower of Christ is to take the cure to the world, right? Say, hey, I got a cure for what's ailing you eternally. Great difficulty. A manner of a steward is with great difficulty. And secondly, is with great boldness. So he said, even after we suffered in Philippi, we had boldness in our God to declare the gospel of God to you. Boldness in what? Boldness in who? Boldness in ourselves? Look at look what I can do. Look at what I, you know, I listen to my presentation of the gospel. No. Boldness in our own abilities. Boldness in the person of Jesus. Boldness in the claims of Jesus. Boldness in the God we serve. Acts chapter 4, verse 31 New, brand new believers in brand new church. They're gathered together. They're praying because uh, not everybody's wanting to hear what they have to say. They're praying. And Luke records, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. It's a fruit of the Spirit, boldness. Next chapter, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And they're told, you've got to stop. We're, we'll let you go. But you got to stop proclaiming, got to stop teaching about this Jesus. And Peter, John said, we must obey God rather than man. Boldness to speak the truth about God's boldness to speak the truth from God. Francis of Assisi, you guys remember him? 13th century. Um, it's like even before my time. Um, I think, I think Francis of Assisi, if I'm not mistaken, he's the guy that invented, came up with the nativity pieces. Anyway, um, famous saying, maybe the most famous of all of his sayings, um, was preach at all times and if necessary, use words. Right? And so people have taken that to mean, well, we just need to live the gospel. Uh, we just need to live godly. And every now and then, maybe we can use our words. Is that biblical? Sort of, maybe, but we are to proclaim. We are to proclaim. Not just like once a year I'm going to tell something about Jesus. Here's the, here's the fact. Francis of Assisi was an open-air preacher. He was an open-air preacher. He proclaimed God's truth. I think what Francis said, and the, he founded the Franciscan monks, uh, I think what he was saying was we always need to be trying to find a way to speak the truth of God's word. There's a time for a silent witness, right? There's a time for a silent witness at work and different settings and family members and, and just living it, right? Just living it. But just by living it, 
is not going to, is not going to instruct people to automatically, oh, I understand that God became a man, lived among us. We've broken his law. So God in the flesh, Jesus died for us, was buried, rose again, sent his Holy Spirit. We need to trust in him. That needs to be explained to people, right? There's a time for a, a silent witness, but there's a time to proclaim the truth of God. And Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, the love of Christ compels me. And that passage where he says we are ambassadors of Christ, reconciling men to God, the love of Christ compels me. The manner of a steward. Got to be decisive, intentional, and bold, even in the midst of great difficulty. I don't know about circles that, that you run in, but not everybody wants to hear the gospel. Secondly, the message of a steward. Paul continues, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3, and the first part of verse 4. For our gospel does not spring from error or impurity or any uh, attempt to deceive, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. The message of a steward. What exactly are we selling? What exactly is it that we want the world to possess, to know? What's the nature of the message that Paul was entrusted with? What's the nature of the message that we have been entrusted with? There's a whole lot of messages today, isn't there? A whole lot of movements today about all sorts of things. Most of them have some element of truth. But the gospel is what people need to hear. Who is God? What has he done? He created us. We've se been separated from him because of our own sin. And he has made a way alone, not our own good works or striving, doing good, going to church a lot. He has made a way in Christ for us to be reunited with him. This message of a steward is, number one, based upon fact. It is based upon fact. Paul says it's not, it's not out of error or impure motives, out of deception. It's historical fact. This Jesus lived, he suffered, he died, he was buried, and then he disappeared. Well, 40 days, he walked among men, and then he disappeared. And there, uh, since that day, almost 2,000 years ago, men have been trying to produce the bones of Jesus. Where did they put him? Where did he go? Friends, he has not been found. He's found in glory. He will be found when he comes again. But there are many charlatans and hucksters in, in Paul's day. Uh, Jesus warned about false Christs. Oh, this is the one you need to trust in. This is the one that's come to save us. That continues. But there's facts about this Jesus. Born of a virgin, lived perfect life. He was executed. He rose from the dead. He ascended into glory. And he's coming back. And we are all going to stand before him. Most of those facts have already happened. His return is yet to come. Everybody seated in this room right now is yet to stand before him. That is going to happen. Here's the message of the Bible. God made man and man needs God. Right? God made man and man needs God. The apostles all died. except Maybe John, John may have lived a pretty lengthy, very lengthy life, but he was exiled on this little island. The rest of them all died. Because of this message, what'd they die for? For a scam? Oh, this will be funny. Let's tell everybody that Jesus is, came back to life again. They're all dying because of this. Die for some fairy tale? Doesn't that bear a little bit of weight? That the apostles all, knowing that, that continuing to proclaim the gospel would lead to their ultimate demise, and yet they continued to do it. Doesn't that seem a bit strange if this thing was just made up? We're told by missions organizations today that 20th century, 1900s, more people were martyred for the faith than all the previous 19 centuries that the church has been in existence. To combined. People are still, in, in countries around the world, places around the world, people are still being executed for the the message, why don't people just say, no, it's not really real. I don't really know him. Jesus didn't really make himself known to me. 
Would the apostles have done that? Would people through the centuries do that for this made-up story? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul declares that after he rose, after Jesus rose, he, he, he was seen by more than 500 people. No account has ever surfaced that there was a person or a group of persons who said, yeah, we made this whole thing up. Um, we, I, yeah, I don't want to die like everybody else is, or I don't want to be imprisoned or sent away or whatever all was happening. Don't want to have my, my house burned down, whatever. Um, we just made that thing up. There's no account of that. He is real, friends. He is real. And I trust he has revealed himself to you. This is based on fact. And just here's a quick, here's a quick little acronym that, uh, that makes sense to me. MAPS, M-A-P-S, MAPS. M for manuscripts, the amount of manuscripts that, um, that we have, the, the pieces of copies of copies of copies of, of, of God's Word spread out all over the planet, and all of them jive with one another. That's a whole study in itself. Secondly, A for archaeology. Um, archaeology just continues to affirm and confirm the biblical facts and, and, and figures and, and personalities. It, wasn't, it was not very long ago that people thought this King David was just a, a, a made-up figure. Um, and we never found anything with actual King David on it and in recent years, in the recent last few decades. Um, sure enough, unearthed some, some uh, writings that were about this King David. Archaeology just continues to confirm the Bible and is just never finding things that contradict the scriptural account. Manuscripts, A, archaeology, P, prophecy, Oh, we could go on for a long time. We won't. But all of the, every fact and figure about Jesus' life, some a few hundred prophecies about who this coming Messiah would be, where he would be born, uh, how he would live, how he would die, uh, how he would suffer, um, all pointing to this one man, Jesus. Daniel, the book of Daniel. Um, skeptics will say, you know, Daniel is obviously written Hundreds of years after Daniel's life, Daniel couldn't have written that because Daniel precisely described the Babylonian Empire, um, the uh, Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. And we're told, well, he couldn't have, he couldn't have known all that. He knew all that. God showed him all that. Maps, manuscripts, archaeology, prophecy, S for statistics, the Bible, this Bible is written over a period of 1,500 years, 1,500 years, uh, by 40 different authors in three different languages over three different con continents with one message. Now, those are facts. But secondly, under the message of a steward, it is experienced by faith. We're thankful for the facts. We're thankful... Um, it, all of these things that I've mentioned are worthy of jumping into and, and doing study on your own, but, uh, but this message is experienced by faith. It's not enough to just know, yeah, I know Jesus was real. I know what he did. We have to experience this message by faith. John wrote in John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become children of God as many as received him. We, re we receive him by faith, right? All the facts in the world, wonderful, wonderful, but we receive him by faith. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the message of the cross, this teaching about Jesus, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. What? An invisible God became a guy, and that guy died, and he rose again, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are being saved. The believer in Christ, the follower of Christ, looks at the message of Christ and says, that changes everything. That is the very power of God. It's why I live. It's what I live for. It's the one I trust in. Throughout life's difficulties, he's the one I trust in. He holds the future. 
The message of Jesus is experienced by faith. I think Paul would say, kind of did say through his writings, don't take my word for it. Take God at his word. The message of a steward. It's based on fact. And, and we need to avail ourselves to, to the facts of the gospel, the facts of scripture. It is experienced by faith. And third, the motive of a steward uh, the last half of verse 4 through verse 8 says, um, just we, we've been approved by God, entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her, of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, but because we had become very, you had become very dear to us. The motive of a steward. What's the, what's the motive uh, of a steward of the gospel, a, a, the heart of a faithful steward of the gospel? Well, number one, it is not in serving ourselves. Paul said we didn't come with flattery or greed, praise for ourselves, avoided flattery, saying nice things to people, tailoring their words so everybody would like them. That obviously didn't really happen. They weren't seeking man's approval. They weren't seeking to be politically correct or culturally correct. Um, I've shared, I think in even recent weeks, uh, perhaps a number of times, but maybe bearing, worth bearing uh, again. Um, Forty years ago when I came to Christ, um, my friends like, yeah, I don't understand that. That sounds crazy, but good on you, man. Um, you, you're doing probably better than what we're doing, and yeah, that, good for you, right? That was kind of the sentiment. Um, even today, many aren't walking with God, but they thought, man, good for you. You, you got all religious, whatever that's all about, right? Today, just one generation later, you profess faith in Jesus, and um, <clears throat> guys, we are on some people's terror watch list. That Christians are, are the bad guys and they're purporting this hateful speech, bigoted, and they hate this group and they hate that group. How in the world did that all change? The devil's not super happy about this whole gospel thing, by the way, and neither are many people. Paul said we didn't, we didn't try to be politically correct. We didn't try to be culturally correct. He said we didn't come with greed for financial gain. Um, Paul lived in a very suspicious culture. We today, I think, live in a pretty suspicious culture, and so Paul did everything he can't, could to, to let folks know, I'm not just here to try and sell you something, make money off this thing. Not, we're not here to, for personal benefit or personal gain. Cracks me up when people, you know, that maybe they see a... Uh, thank God for people who share Christ on television, huh? But, you know, there's been a couple through the years that, um, yeah, televangelists, they're just greedy, they just want money, this and that. And so my response to folks when they say that is, man, you got to give it a try. Yeah, quit your job and, and just go tell people about Jesus and see if you become rich. Anyway, messing with folks. Um, well, we're not greedy, we're not doing this for, for personal gain, for financial benefit. He said, we're not doing it for the praise of men. Oh, look at, look at my oratory skills. Look at, look, listen to my witness. Um, I think one of the maybe biggest hurdles of an effective witness is not making our witness about us. Um, shared this many times too, but a number of times when I share about being somewhere in the world doing this or that or an encounter I've had, sometimes after the fact, the Lord says, were you just talking about yourself there? Was that just so you might look good? 
or are we really trying to edify people? Yeah, he challenges me with that kind of thing. Um, oh, I was here, and I did this, and I did that. It's not about us, right? It's not about us. We're not looking for the praise of man. Paul said we're looking for the, to please God, not to please man. Paul was given a message, a message for everyone, everywhere, that everybody desperately needed to receive. Kind of like a tornado s- siren. If you're from the Midwest, you probably heard your share of tornado sirens. I don't imagine the guys at the weather service are like, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't everybody love us if we just set off the tornado siren? Wouldn't that be cool? It's just for fun, you know? People think we're really neat. Oh, we set off the... No, it's a, they're like, this is going to be super obnoxious, but there's danger coming, and people need to hear that they could be in danger, right? The gospel message, kind of like a tornado siren. Not everybody's going to want to hear it, but everybody needs to hear it, right? Because danger is coming. So we're all going to stand before God one day. We're either putting our trust in ourselves or we're putting our trust in Him. Not in serving. The motive of the steward, not in serving ourselves. Secondly, rather in serving others. And Paul says here, I was, was gentle with you, caring for you, loving you like a nurse, like a mother. Some look at that and say, like, that's kind of that's kind of oversharing, Paul. That's a little that's a little that's a little weird. Uh, and yeah, I think Paul's point was uh, we didn't come to to be controlling. Hey, you need to come to my church. Hey, you, you need to be like me. They didn't come to hover over people and, and control them. Their message was, hey, you need to go to Jesus. You need to go to my Savior, right? You don't need to come to me. You don't need to come to my church, to our gatherings. You don't need to be like me. You need to go to my Jesus. You need to go to my Savior. Why does God put people around us? Why does God put people around us that he puts around us? To make our lives fuller a little bit, right? People enrich our lives, the people that God puts in our lives, sometimes it really fulfill our lives, really enrich our lives. To make our lives miserable, God puts some people in our lives to teach us patience and grace, right? Um, I remember um, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, 40 Days of Purpose, the book and the study guide. We went through that many, many years ago, um, a couple times with groups. And there's one chapter called EGR, um, Extra Grace Required. And how do you, how do you deal with EGR people, uh, people that, that, have, that require extra grace? And we had a lot of fun with that, actually. Um, God puts people in our lives so we can share truth, demonstrate truth, encourage them to walk in truth, explain the truth to them. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, 14, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Follower of Jesus is salt to preserve the culture around them, to, to be light so people can see in the darkness uh, what they're about to stumble in and they can see the truth, right? We're to be salt, we're to be light. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, be ready always to explain to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and respect. All right, we're to share the hope that is in us with, with anyone who asks, anyone who is interested in even hearing, yet we've got to do it with gentleness and respect. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 24, 5, 6, uh, the, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind toward everyone. So again, there's that tension. As far as it depends upon us, be at peace with all men, and woe to you when all men speak well of you. God puts people around us so we can serve them, so we can encourage them, we can spur them on, to to righteousness, we can demonstrate the truth, we can speak the truth to them, we can encourage them in the truth. The motive of a steward, not in serving ourselves, we don't don't take the gospel because it serves us, rather in serving others, someone serving folks downstairs. Um, The follower of Christ, about done, follower of Christ, God has given us this precious truth of the gospel. 
He has given us the precious truth of the gospel, and he's called us to be faithful stewards of it. What are we doing with the truth of, of who Jesus is? Are we just hoarding it up, saying, I got mine, you go get yours, I got, I got all the Jesus I need? No, we're to take it and we're to share it with everybody we can, right? We're to take this message of the gospel to everyone. Amen. Amen, sister. There we go. We got one. All right, I want to conclude with this. I think this is in your, in your uh, outline, in your bulletin. <clears throat> uh, Michael Holmes, who, um, in his treatment of First and Second Thessalonians, uh, just very insightful. He gives four attitudes or behaviors that Paul models um, just overall in, uh, in his letter to the th two letters of the Thessalonians. And um, in particular, in this, in this passage here, I just want to lay out real quickly for you four attitudes and behaviors that Paul models. First, Paul models a clear sense of priority. S clear sense of priorities. Number one, priority for Paul is serving God faithfully. He makes that very, very clear. Serving God faithfully. That ought to be the, the, the number one priority for every follower of Christ, right? Let's not take that for granted. The New Testament says our priorities ought to be to pray for, to prepare for, to practice, and to proclaim God's priorities, right? To, to pray God's priorities, to prepare, to walk in God's priorities, to practice, to proclaim God's priorities, to be pleasers of God and not pleasers of men, like Paul said in, in verse 4 here. Secondly, Paul models a clear sense of concern for the integrity of the gospel. A clear sense of concern for the integrity of the gospel. Paul guarded the credibility of the gospel pretty tightly, uh, not behaving in, in ways that would create suspicion, like, um, hey, the message is wonderful, but the messengers are kind of tweaked. Let's, let's avoid that best we can, right? Um, none of us are perfect. That's what we're striving for. But we, let's not just say, yeah, the message is perfect that I'm proclaiming. You got to listen to the message. No, people listen to our, our lives too, right? People listen to the messengers as well. So let's be messengers who try to uphold the integrity of the gospel. Does that make sense? Right? The message is squeaky clean. We, not so much, but let's not, let's not add to the confusion, add to the suspicion. Let's, let's carefully walk with God. In a way, I know people don't look at us, but people do look at us, right? And so let's be, let's be wise stewards Again, Paul's day, people were well aware of the scam artists and hucksters and the phonies. So Paul desired to live an authentic, genuine life, and we had a, we had a desire to do the same, right? To, the, the message is perfect. We are not, but let's strive for that. Let's be humble, right? Not, not just any more messed up than we are. How about that? Paul models a clear sense of priority. Secondly, a clear sense of concern for the integrity of the gospel. Third, a clear sense of love and commitment to all people. To those he was sharing the message with, he, he had a clear sense of love and commitment. As his own children, he says. Like there are, he kind of took ownership, right? Uh, I owe it to people, I think was Paul's attitude. I owe it to people to, to plead with them, to listen to what Jesus has done for them. People puts, um, people that God puts in, in our lives today, I think Paul would say that those are our responsibility to some extent, right? Be careful of that. We're not responsible for everything everybody does, but a little sense of God put people in my life and I, I want to have at least a healthy responsibility for them. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I want to have a healthy responsibility for the people that puts that God puts in my life to nurse their wounds, if you would. That seems to be what Paul is saying in this passage here. He wants to, he wants to take some ownership in people's lives, not controlling, but, but taking some responsibility. How you doing? How, how can I help you with this or that? And fourth, Paul models a clear sense of the goal toward which he worked. Paul's goal was to move people toward Jesus, and I think that ought to be a goal in our lives. People are to attend when they are just fully devoted to Jesus, like you all are. Tens, man. We're tens on the chart of fully committed to Jesus. Yeah, not everybody's at a ten. 
But what we ought to do is move people from, from a one to a three, right? I don't care anything about Jesus to, and I'm kind of interested in this Jesus that you talk about. Or move people from a four to a seven, right? I, I'm really interested, but I, I want to, right? Does that make sense? We need to move the needle. Our goal ought to be to help people move that, to help people move that needle, move people toward more and more committed to Jesus. Does that make sense at all? Paul had a clear sense of the goal toward which he worked, to move the needle in people's lives, to move people closer to Jesus, to be intentional in helping others. Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Like when we're walking with God, we are, we are offering refreshing and shade and, and nourishment for, for other people. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. That is the ultimate fruit, isn't it? To win souls, to, to help people embrace who Jesus is. Being stewards of God's truth. Stewardship. That concludes our stewardship series. God owns everything. He made all things. We need to be good stewards of the time that he's given us, the talents that he's given us, the treasure that he's given us, and the truth that he has given us. And I want to just conclude this final less uh, message in this series. The believer's most precious possession is that which he must never keep to himself, the gospel. The believer's most precious possession is that which they must never keep to themselves, the gospel. Let's give this thing away, right? If God's opened your eyes to who he is, what he's done in Christ, we have a little bit of responsibility, don't we, to to pass it along. Guys, somebody passed it to you. Somebody helped you grow in him. Somebody helped you along, the, along this journey. How about be, we be the one to help others? Amen? Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the truth that you have given us. Lord, we rely on that truth this morning as many among us are not able to be here for various reasons. We are reminded this morning that life is difficult. That this life has many challenges. Father, we are reminded this morning that it's just pretty hard to get super comfortable in this life. Some of the issues of life, sickness, sorrow, suffering, remind us that this world is not our home. We just can't get super comfortable in this world. But Father, would you, would you grace us by allowing us to recognize that we are at home and we're in your presence. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, difficulties, heartache, grow, grow dim. Your goodness grows large. Father, may we not keep this truth of the gospel to ourselves. May we willingly share it with all that we come in contact with. Would you help us to start those conversations? Would you help us to graciously, with gentleness and respect, move the needle in people's lives through a word, through an action, through a conversation to move them a little closer to you? For Lord, we know, we know the world is sick and we have the cure. May we not be lax in passing out the cure. Father, we thank you for our time together. Again, we pray for those who were unable to be here. Their various situations, Lord, pour out your grace. Pour out your grace on your people. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Mm -hmm. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now and give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful, yeah. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down surrender now give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God And I will sing of the goodness of God Let's commit to taking a little bit of time this week, each day, to embrace the goodness of God. All that he has, all that he is, all that he has for us, let's take some time to embrace his goodness. Amen? Have a great rest of your day. Have a great rest of the week. Hope to see you soon. You are dismissed.